When people talk about the more obscure survival horror gems on the PS2, there's a lot of names that always get a mention. Siren for its anxiety-inducing gameplay, Haunting Ground for its dark yet relevant storytelling, Kuan for its beautiful design and setting, but there's one game in particular that has a reputation that precedes it, a game that is faster recognised for the controversy that surrounded it more than it's recognised for its story, characters or gameplay. That game is Rule of Rose. Rule of Rose began development in the early 2000s when Sony Japan wanted to create a horror title that had a strong focus on psychological storytelling. They entrusted the studio Punchline to develop this game, which was quite a risky move considering they had only released one other game up until that point, the 2002 adventure game Tulip, where the central mechanic involves kissing people. <laughs> yeah, quite the far cry from horror I'd say. Or maybe it's equally as horrifying, guess it depends on your perspective. The team tossed a few ideas to Sony, all drawing inspiration from the dark and often cruel storytelling you'd see from the likes of Brothers Grim Fairy Tales. And in a similar fashion to Grim Fairy Tales, Punchline wanted the cast to be made up almost entirely of children. <laughs> Which may sound like a bold move, and that's because it was, but the developers had strong faith in their artistic choice and what it could bring to the table. We wanted to depict the darker side of children. Not really dark, per se, but if you really think about kids, they aren't really afraid of the same things that adults are, and often aren't aware of the consequences. Something that may seem benign to them may seem wrong or frightening to adults, but it's really just a form of innocence. We sort of wanted to show not only how scary adults can be from a child's perspective, because that's been touched on many times, but also how scary children can be from an adult's perspective. We want to see that contrast. Unfortunately, Rule of Rose was doomed before it even hit store shelves, as an Italian article was released in late 2006 damning the game for its violent, shocking scenes. Scenes that aren't even in the game. It didn't take long for this article to do the rounds across Europe, and would you believe me if I told you Rule of Rose even became the hot topic in the European Parliament? Seriously, the moral panic that erupted because of this game is insane. All built on complete lies. There's a lot more to unpack with this controversy, as you can imagine, and we'll look at it more in depth later. But despite all of this bad press, Rule of Rose has since garnered a very strong cult following. Ask anyone who's into retro survival horror, and Rule of Rose is often said to be one of those hidden gems, a rough-around-the-edges masterpiece. I mean, I've even seen it described as a great example of video games as an art form. I guess the only way to find out whether or not that's true is to jump in and see for ourselves. So, let's give Rule of Rose a whirl to see if it lives up to that name. The game opens up on a CGI intro where we see our protagonist Jennifer sitting in a park. She notices two kids playing nearby just as an airship ominously looms overhead. It then suddenly jumps around to us seeing Jennifer falling into a coffin, and then there's also a massive fish in the sky, and honestly this opening makes a little to no sense when you have no context of the story, but either way, it is very pretty. All of the CGI cutscenes in this were made by Shirogumi, an animation studio that has since gone on to make adaptions of IPs like Doraemon and Dragon Quest quite the tonal shift from Rule of Rose, I would say. But seriously, they are such a treat to look at and still look great even now. They were definitely making the most of the PS2 hardware to pull off these visuals. When we start the game, we see Jennifer dozing off on a bus ride before she's approached by a young boy. He asks her to continue reading a story to him, but when she opens the book, it's blank. The boy runs off the bus suddenly and into the nearby forest, but when Jennifer tries to stop him, she soon finds herself stranded. With nowhere to go, she decides to follow the path into the forest, eventually coming across a seemingly abandoned building. Jennifer isn't able to find that young boy, but she did instead find a coffin with a small bag in it. Without getting much chance to investigate, Jennifer is approached by a group of young girls who push her into the coffin and carry her away. Definitely quite an ominous opening that leaves more questions than it does answers. When Jennifer comes to, she finds herself on an airship where a voice speaks to her, telling her that she must now give the so-called aristocrat club a gift every month or else they'll kill her. You will follow my orders or else, <laughs> for I am the prince and the prince rules. <laughs> this is your life, but you'll play by my rules. <laughs> With seemingly no other choice in the matter, Jennifer begins to look around for her first monthly gift, a beautiful butterfly. This is when we're given a chance to look around a little bit and get our bearings. Much like its contemporary haunting ground, Rule of Rose opts for a semi-fixed camera angle style of gameplay, but it does tend to switch things up a little bit now and then. Sometimes the camera will follow along behind Jennifer, and other times it's a little bit more static. 
pivoting on the spot to follow Jennifer's movements instead. After all, this was in that weird transitional era where survival horrors were gradually moving away from the more antiquated fixed camera angles in favor of more dynamic camera movement, and it definitely makes sense in a game like this. The airship is full of very tight corridors and narrow hallways, so much so that I think fixed camera angles would have just been way too cramped. As we explore the airship, we come across the members of the Aristocrat Club and soon discover that there's a social rank amongst its members. There's Diana, who seems to be the leader of sorts, there's Eleanor, her second-in-command, as well as Meg, and all three of these girls are in the refined class, as they call it, while Amanda and now Jennifer herself are in the lower class. It seems that Jennifer will have to rise through the ranks if she's to be taken seriously by the other girls, and until then she is snubbed by them, often leaving her as the butt of jokes or the victim of cruel pranks. As such, each chapter of the game takes place over the course of a month, usually revolving around finding the monthly gift for the aristocrats and getting glimpses into the girls and their relationships. Navigating the airship looking for gifts is mostly manageable, there's only a handful of major areas in it to begin with, so you can't ever really get too terribly lost. I would say a lot of the areas can begin to look quite samey, especially the turbine area and its connecting hallways. I don't know how, but I just could not find my way in this area. There is a map, but it's honestly a lot to take in at first glance, so I wasn't very inclined to look at it much. It's just a jumble of lines to me, honestly. Do get used to looking at this animation, though. There is a lot of doors around every corner, and you'll be seeing this a lot. Yeah, if you have to backtrack or find yourself getting lost, it's a little bit tiring with all these door animations every few seconds. Especially in one of the later chapters where you have to go all the way from one end of the ship to the other and then back again. I genuinely think half of my playtime in that chapter was just spent watching Jennifer open doors. Anyway, after looking around for a bit, Jennifer eventually finds a poor dog that's been bound and tied up in the turbine area. This is Brown, our companion for the rest of the game. You can definitely see why this game gets compared to Haunting Ground a lot, they do share a lot of similarities, but I would argue Brown plays a much more central role here. In Haunting Ground, Huey was mainly there to defend you and help out with the occasional puzzle, but in Rule of Rose, Brown is more or less your only means of progressing the story, mainly because of the find mechanic. Brown can use the scent of an item to track it down, which is something you have to rely on heavily to look for key and health items. For example, while searching for the Aristocrat Club's monthly gift, we find an insect case in one of the bedrooms. Setting it as our find objective and commanding Brown to then search for it, he'll eventually lead us to one of the neighbouring hallways and voila, there's our butterfly. You can also command Brown to stay and follow you as necessary, which is a mechanic you really only need for enemy encounters to avoid him taking any unnecessary damage. There's not much need for it outside of that, I found. He can take damage, but I'm pretty sure he can't die. I mean, it never happened to me if so. Instead, he'll faint and you'll have to use a healing item to wake him up. Between healing items, weapons, and key items, there are a lot of things to find as you explore. There is an item box in the form of this little rubbish bin, and using it you can store and swap out items as you please. You can even send items from your inventory directly to the item box regardless of where you are on the airship, which is a godsend because your inventory is going to get filled up really quickly. <laughs> a good few story beats are told through letters or hand-drawn storybooks, but every time you get one, it takes up a slot in your inventory. So you could go to pick up a new item and it's like, oh, okay, my inventory's full. Oh yeah, because I have like four pieces of paper in there. I don't see why they couldn't have gone down the Resident Evil or Silent Hill route where notes or letters are just stored in your files instead of taking up a whole inventory slot. Just feels like a little bit of a clumsy system, to be honest, but at least there's an easy solution. And this is what the majority of Rule of Rose's progression comes down to, having Brown sniff out a key item or having him just lead you to the next point of interest. It's definitely very light on puzzles. I mean, I don't think there's any puzzles at all, really. At least not in the traditional sense that you'd expect from a survival horror. I could see this being off-putting to some people, for sure, but Rule of Rose places great importance on its storytelling and atmosphere over the gameplay. The developers themselves even described it as more of an interactive movie than a game, with the focus being on unraveling the mystery of the Aristocrat Club and why Jennifer was dragged into it. And I was hooked on this narrative. The admittedly very simple gameplay loop didn't bother me, I was far too invested in learning more about the girls and their relationships to let it bother me. This is all enhanced by the game's overall visual design. So much effort has been put into it to give it a very whimsical, almost childlike aesthetic. 
The narration, for example, is written in a way that makes it feel like a fairy tale, Jennifer always being referred to as the poor, unlucky girl, while all the aristocrats have their own titles, the strong-willed princess, the wise-looking princess, the cold princess, and so on. The save point is a scarecrow that looks like it was hastily thrown together by a child, and each chapter starts off with a hand-drawn storybook with these cute little drawings. So much care has been put into making the narrative and overall visual direction look like it jumped straight out of a kid's storybook, which is ten times more effective when contrasted with how dark the story gets. And the music, oh my god, the music, the music makes me feel so many good emotions, it is so beautiful. The soundtrack is almost entirely classical music with loads of strings and pianos and it is just wonderful, it really fits the 1930s setting of the game, not to mention how much it helps us stand out from the crowd, I mean how many games can you think of with an entirely classical soundtrack? My favourite has to be the more ambient tracks. They have such a sombre, melancholic sound to them that just really complements the tone of Rule of Rose well. I feel anyone who's a fan of the works of Joe Hisaishi, aka the guy who composed the majority of Studio Ghibli's films, will have a lot of love for the soundtrack here. There's a lot of great examples to pick from, but my favourite had to be this track called The Attic, one you'll hear quite a bit throughout the game and personally, I was very okay with that. The composer for Rule of Rose was Yutaka Minobe, who previously worked on a lot of Sega games like Skies of Arcadia, Panzer Dragoon, and even some of my personal favourites like Space Channel 5 and Sonic. It's kind of insane though to think that the same guy who went on to compose Rule of Rose previously worked on games like this. But when Rule of Rose is flawed, it's flawed. If you've played this before, you already know what I'm talking about. The combat. Yeah, as you probably would have guessed by now, this game does indeed have combat and whew, oh boy, where to start with this one? I've played many a survival horror with clunky controls, I am well used to them by now and I like to think I'm a fairly patient person, but oh my god, I'm sorry, but this is possibly the worst combat I've ever played in a survival horror and I've played Silent Hill. You eventually encounter these small imp creatures, which serve as basically the only enemy in Rule of Rose. There are some variations, some imps carry a weapon or have different attack patterns, but for the most part you deal with all of them in much the same fashion. Dodge their attack, go in for a swing, rinse and repeat. Standard retro horror fare, right? But the combat system likes to make that as difficult for you as possible. For one, Jennifer runs very slowly, as you've probably noticed by now, and that's fine during exploration, none of the areas are that big, so her running speed suits the environment she's in. But in combat, it's a totally different story. A lot of the enemies are simply too fast for Jennifer, often swiping or jumping on her before you get much opportunity to react. This wouldn't be so much of an issue, perhaps, if most encounters were just one-on-one. -on -one. If there's only one enemy in front of you, great, the combat's rough, but you eventually get into the swing of it and you make do with what you have. Anytime there's more than one enemy though, you're done. <laughs> you will suffer, you will objectively have a bad time. If dodging one bad guy takes careful bobbing and weaving just to not get hit, try dealing with four or five of them at once and an already dreadful battle system just crumbles even further. Jennifer's attacks, much like her movement, are far too sluggish to keep up with a horde of enemies, so for every hit you might land, you're probably going to take a hit in return. To make matters worse, when you want to move her away from an enemy, she does this curved motion, for lack of a better word. It's not an instant dash away and that's also probably going to land you some unfair hits. By the time you notice the enemy going in for the kill, Jennifer won't be fast enough to get away. Then if she's hit on the ground, she takes like 5 seconds just to get up and if an enemy was already swinging by the time you stand up, then up, oh, you're on the ground again. Oh my god, this, this sucks. <laughs> And to rub salt on the wound, if Jennifer takes too many hits, she starts limping so slowly, like you may as well just reload your save and try again, because if she wasn't already slow enough, then limping as slowly as this is just the fast track to dying. Jennifer's also able to stomp enemies if they're on the floor, but I don't think this does anything at all. I was constantly trying to get an extra hit in, but there's just no reaction, like is this doing anything? Thankfully most encounters can be skipped, and I would highly recommend doing so. If you don't have to fight, don't bother. But there's a lot of forced encounters where you just can't avoid the combat system and oh man, it can completely kill any immersion or enjoyment you might be feeling. Dude, there's one chapter about halfway through that was really pissing me off. You have to go through this maze-like area but there's like four forced encounters back to back along the way in these cramped little spaces. 
If I have to deal with this rough combat system, at least give me a little more room to work with. Or this section here, where you're just going down this narrow path and it just throws like 20 of them at you. Like, who thought this was fair? I just keep taking hits and then, oh great, all of my health is gone now. And this is right before a boss fight too, like, come on, this is cruel. But probably the worst issue with Rule of Rose's combat are the hitboxes. They are insane. Seriously, the hitboxes are abysmal here, and you will suffer many unfair hits and deaths because of them. The first time you'll probably notice it is in the first boss fight, not too long into the game. This guy just swings like mad, and you really need to make some distance or he'll probably hit you. I mean, what was that? I was nowhere near him, and he hits hard too. You really need to go into these boss fights with a lot of healing or you're honestly screwed. It doesn't help that enemies have very weird iframes sometimes, where you could just swing but they just won't take damage, but unfortunately you don't get that same luxury in return, so it just feels like a severely unbalanced system that works against you every step of the way. But the second boss fight is even worse, the infamous mermaid boss. This is just so needlessly drawn out, man. She retracts up to the ceiling every few seconds, so most of the fight is just spent sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for her to come down so you can maybe land one hit, two if you're lucky, and then rinse and repeat for the next five minutes. <sighs> Don't even get me started on her green goop move. Get stuck in that and you're just in an infinite loop of taking insane damage. Get used to hearing this for five minutes straight, by the way. If you do choose to play this game and suffer through the combat, I highly recommend getting the steel pipe early on and never letting go of it. Its range is a godsend and the damage isn't the best, but it works. A lot of the shorter range weapons like knives are just way too risky with the janky hitboxes. The steel pipe is your friend because you'll probably be surprised to find there are no guns of any sort here. Well, that's a lie. You can get a revolver way later on, but it sucks and there's like no bullets for it. So, you know, that's that. Yeah, the combat is just severely undercooked and feels very much like an afterthought. And it's a crying shame because the atmosphere, story, music are all so fascinating and well-crafted. It's a shame it has to be locked behind such poorly developed combat that'll just leave you tearing your hair out. But trust me when I say that the story and how it unfolds is so worth it if you have the patience to power through. On that note, let's discuss the plot of Rule of Rose. So you know the drill, spoilers incoming, you've been warned, blah blah blah. Skip ahead to here if you don't want to hear anything about it. Things are going to get a little heavy from here on out, by the way. The story is definitely pretty dark, so do be aware of that going in. Alright, let's go. As the months go by, Jennifer eventually wins the favour of the aristocrats, much to Amanda's disdain. Jennifer isn't really that much better off, though, as the aristocrats still treat her like dirt all the same. A man named Gregory is often seen wandering around the airship and keeps calling Jennifer Joshua instead for some reason. He even kidnaps her at one point, holding her hostage in his house until Wendy, one of the girls on the airship, comes to save us. We never really spoke to Wendy all that much up until now. Because of her illness, she's often confined to the sick bay, but she grows very fond of Jennifer, even saying that she'll cherish her teddy bear as much as she cherishes her. Jennifer wakes up one day in the same building we saw at the very beginning of the game. We wander around to see all of the girls doing chores, none of them acknowledging Jennifer. After a while, Brown suddenly disappears. Following his cries up to the attic, we see the aristocrats waiting for Jennifer, where they reveal that they've killed Brown. And this is the scene that flips everything we thought about Rule of Rose up until now on its head. Your friend is in the bag. It's too late now. Nothing we experienced until now was really happening. Well, more specifically, they were all Jennifer's traumatic memories from her childhood. Being kidnapped by Gregory, the Red Crayon aristocrats and their awful bullying, her relationship with Wendy, Brown's death, all of these were repressed memories that Jennifer is now coming to terms with as an adult. When Jennifer was young, she was on an airship with her parents, but a crash landed, leaving her as the only survivor. Before she could be saved, she was kidnapped by Gregory, a grieving man who had lost his son Joshua to an illness. 
So, after finding Jennifer, he began to raise her almost as a replacement son to cope from the loss. One day, Wendy saved her from Gregory's house, bringing her to the nearby orphanage, the building we found ourselves in at multiple points throughout the story. Wendy eventually developed feelings for Jennifer, and the two girls made a promise to each other. Everlasting, true love, I am yours. But finding Brown one day as a puppy, all of Jennifer's attention went to him instead, so much so that Wendy began to feel jealous. Especially since she was a sickly child and spent many of her days in the sick ward, that loneliness began to fester, eventually turning into resentment towards Brown for stealing Jennifer away from her. All of the other girls joined in on the bullying as well, but to no avail. So Wendy decided her only solution was to kill Brown to get him out of the picture and win back Jennifer's affections. So then, how did this dark story end? After this, Wendy realized she was fighting a losing battle and went to Gregory's house dressed as his son, emotionally manipulating him into coming to the orphanage with her to scare the other girls into submission. But Gregory, being severely mentally unstable, killed everyone at the orphanage instead. Everyone except Jennifer, perhaps because he still associated her with his deceased son. And so, realizing the severity of what he'd done, Gregory ended his own life. The last chapter lets us play as a young Jennifer at last, finally having come to terms with her past as she recalls a happy day at the orphanage before the massacre, the day when she found Brown as a puppy. She builds a bucket prince next to Brown, the scarecrow we had been using as a save point throughout the game, as if to symbolize that she'll never forget him, and writes the same promise she once made to Wendy underneath, this time for Brown. Everlasting, true love, I am yours. It's been a long time since the story hit me as hard as Rule of Rose did. It's a dark, cautionary tale about how love, while a pure emotion at its core, can fester into something dark and destructive. It's definitely a game, though, that you need to experience twice to appreciate everything about it. Knowing the ending and how it recontextualizes the story, so many things that seem nonsensical or absurd in your first playthrough suddenly make a lot more sense. The airship setting, because it's where Jennifer lost her parents, Gregory constantly calling her Joshua after his late son, and then visions of Wendy dressed up as Joshua throughout the game, they're all Jennifer's jumbled up memories from her childhood that she's slowly unraveling and coming to terms with in adulthood. And you have to remember that, throughout the game, you were re-experiencing the memories of a young child, you were seeing it through the lens of a young Jennifer, and so a lot of her memories aren't clear, probably because she didn't understand what was happening at the time. And Rule of Rose uses this childlike lens to masterfully tell its dark story. Wendy was a lonely child who grew fond of Jennifer because she was the first and only person to give her attention and love. Wendy's fondness for her became obsessive, her desperation leading to her killing an animal just to have her way. I really like that we barely ever see Wendy during the majority of the story, mirroring how Jennifer ignored her as a child. Much like how Jennifer neglected Wendy, you, the player, also neglected her without even realizing. And yet, despite the very evil thing Wendy did in Killing Brown, there's something deeply sympathetic about her as a character. Children don't have the foresight and awareness that adults or teenagers do. They don't realize the severity of their actions, often because they're still innocent to the world and how it works. As an adult, we can confidently say that dressing up as someone's deceased child is a disgustingly evil and manipulative thing to do, but for Wendy, it was a cry for help, a desperate means to an end for people to pay attention to her. Even in her final moments, she's aware that what she did was wrong, but unfortunately, it's too late. The damage is done, and everyone, including herself, lost their lives because of it. Listening back on the game's main theme, very aptly called a love suicide, the lyrics very clearly reflect Wendy's conflicted emotions towards Jennifer. I want to be dead when I am, I'm in bed. I can be so me, you can beat me. I would like to shame you, 
I would like to blame you Just because of my love to you And in the final chapter, when Jennifer reflects on her childhood, she gently kisses Wendy on the forehead and closes the gate behind her, as if to imply Jennifer, in adulthood, harbours no ill feelings towards Wendy anymore. She's finally found closure and come to terms with her past. Wendy, now nothing more than a memory. Amanda is another character who depicts a very particular childhood experience. Before Jennifer showed up, Amanda was always the one who got pushed around by the aristocrats. She was the small fry of the group, and so when someone joins her in the lower class and is finally on her level, she seems to get joy in having someone she can push around. She was finally given the slightest bit of power over someone else, and she's running with it, enjoying being able to torture Jennifer. But when Jennifer ends up being favoured by the aristocrats, Amanda starts to hate her. She becomes resentful towards Jennifer because she's gotten what Amanda seemingly can't, the approval and social acceptance of the other girls. Her hatred of Jennifer even goes so far that she creates a life-size punching bag of her, which just shows how she spirals mentally throughout the events of the game to the point of being severely mentally unhinged. <laughs> And while that is a problem in and of itself, it comes from a very understandable place. She just wants to be accepted, she just wants to not be bullied for once. But again, being a child, she doesn't know how to articulate that in a healthy way, so it turns into a concerning, violent jealousy instead. You know, the way the girls treat each other in this game really hit close to home for me, and it made me recall some of my own childhood memories. I know everyone went through this to some degree or another, but I went to an all-girls school, and so I can personally attest to how realistic the aristocrats' behaviour is. And, you know, not to generalise an entire gender, of course, I'm sure boys can act in this very same way, but girls can get very... bitchy when they want to be. The power dynamic between the likes of Diana and Meg and how they think they can treat you differently because you're lower than them is painfully relatable, which made some of the scenes feel a little too real, you know? Aristocrats! You're just the opposite! I hate you! And I hate you! And you! And I hate myself the very most for playing your stupid games and not having the strength to stand up to you! Man, just, I wish I could have said that back then, you know, and Jennifer's struggle to stand up for herself and her shame looking back in it as an adult is an insanely relatable thing, which makes the writing here so much more powerful. It's interesting then how they contrast the girls' behaviour with the boys, because you never even really see the boys throughout the game. At best you see them playing with sticks and messing around, but they're never involved in the bullying and the strange hierarchy that the aristocrats have made for themselves. It's interesting. Apparently this was an intentional choice on the devs' part because they believed girls tend to bully in a more psychological way, while boys typically bully in a more physical way, which is something I would generally agree on from how I remember childhood. Of all the scenes showcasing that social hierarchy though, the one that stuck out in my mind the most, funnily enough, was this one. Eleanor, who's amongst the upper class alongside Diana and Meg, finds that her pet bird has gone missing. While Jennifer is helping search for it, she hears someone coming so hides in one of the bathroom stalls. Diana and Meg come in and start gossiping, unaware that Jennifer is in the stall right next to them, revealing that they were the ones who took the bird as a prank on Eleanor, even though they are apparently friends with her, at least they act like that to her face. It's funny that out of all the scenes of bullying in this game, this is the one that impacted me the most. Not the scenes with animal cruelty or Amanda's violent tendencies, but just two girls being two-faced to one of their friends and feeling justified in doing so just because Eleanor is a quiet, reserved character. 
She's more of a closed book, and because of that, even she's not safe from being bullied, despite being in the same social rank as them. She's bullied just because she's different, an experience I think a lot of us can probably relate to as kids. She had it coming. Yes, she deserved it. Hmm. Are we too cruel? <laughs> Heavens no! <laughs> You're right, it's her own fault. <laughs> <laughs> as stoic as Eleanor is, though, she barely reacts to the news that her bird was killed, continuing to carry around the empty birdcage for the rest of the game. Maybe she carries it around to keep the bird in her thoughts, or just finds comfort in feeling like it's still with her. Regardless of her reasoning, even if she may not show it on the outside, they hurt Eleanor and show no remorse for doing so. But that's just how bullies work, right? There's a reason bullying is so bad when you're a kid, because kids lack the mental maturity to understand the lasting impact it can have on someone. I can bet you that you probably remember something nasty someone said or did to you as a kid, because it is traumatic, especially in your formative years, when you're probably lacking in self-confidence and words hurt all the more because of it. Children need a parent to guide them, they need someone to watch over them and teach them when to say please and thank you. When an action is right or wrong, they need to be taught morality. Being orphans, the girls at the aristocrat club don't have that, and so Rule of Rose is a harrowing exploration of the chaos that can happen when such behaviour goes unchecked. Now, in saying that, there are technically parental figures in their lives, mainly Hoffman, the headmaster, but here is where we find a rather upsetting subplot, and another strong example of how Rule of Rose uses that childlike lens I described earlier to subtly tell a very solemn story. More specifically, Hoffman's relationship with one of the older girls at the orphanage, Clara, who we barely ever encounter throughout the story. In fact, we never see Clara interact with anyone ever really besides Hoffman. She does get a bit of attention though about halfway through the game, during the Mermaid Princess chapter. The girls are disagreeing over whether or not mermaids exist, so Diana and Jennifer end up searching for one together. As we explore, we see Hoffman and Clara eventually going to a bedroom alone together. And considering we also see him getting a little too friendly with Diana in that same chapter, yeah, you can probably guess what's going on here. Clara is very guarded any time we interact with her outside of this chapter. The last time we see her, she's cleaning the sick bay area, and when Hoffman calls for her, she visibly tenses up. But of course, Jennifer wouldn't have been able to understand what was going on here at such a young age. It's not even very really clear whether or not she dies in the ending. Considering she was in her late teens, she may very well have already been gone by the time Wendy brought Gregory to the orphanage. One thing we do know, however, is Hoffman left the orphanage very suddenly at one point, with no clear reason why. Perhaps this is implying people eventually grew suspicious of his behaviour, but either way, we unfortunately never know the ending to Clara's story. The mermaid boss fight, as awful as it is from a gameplay perspective, is very symbolic of Clara's experiences. Even during the fight, the mermaid is constantly whimpering and crying, and its bound feet could be a representation of Clara feeling trapped in her situation with Hoffman. It does seem that Clara was meant to have more screen time, or at the very least a bit more character development. There's quite a few voice lines that were never used in the final game, and I do recommend checking them out if you're interested, but be warned, they can be hard to listen to. How can I, I, I get, 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 get out? What do I do? But I, I, I don't want to go outside. But I don't want to stay in here either. I, help me. I, I'm all alone. <laughs> all al alone, alone. Clara's story in Rule of Rose instantly reminded me of Angela from Silent Hill 2. Both are a masterclass in telling a sensitive, troubling story in an artistic way. They're great examples of less is more storytelling, and a testament to the fact that you don't need to show violence or upsetting imagery to shock the player, as many horror games tend to rely on. It's the fact we don't see it, and their stories are merely implied through words or actions that make it all the more effective. And you might be wondering as well, why does Clara end up becoming a boss fight then? It's not like Clara was evil or anything. Perhaps the boss fight itself is meant to be symbolic of Jennifer coming to terms with what she witnessed as a child. Looking back on it in hindsight as an adult, she struggles to come to terms with the knowledge that Clara was silently suffering and Jennifer did nothing about it. And this isn't Jennifer's fault, of course, but she likely feels guilt all the same. Following this train of thought, I believe the imps exist for a similar reason. 
My gripes with the combat system aside, I feel the enemies are a representation of the small part of Jennifer's mind that may still be unwilling to accept the truth. Their childlike appearance and the way they cling to her almost as if they're trying to physically stop her from delving deeper into her own past feels like a very intentional design choice to me. The entirety of Rule of Rose, after all, is just a deep dive into Jennifer's psyche. And given the dark nature of her childhood, a bit of mental resistance is natural, it's only human. The last time we ever see the imps is at the orphanage, right before Jennifer learns about Brown's death. They claw at the windows as if desperately trying to stop her from learning the truth. A truth that will be undoubtedly hard to hear. Rule of Rose is the perfect example of a flawed masterpiece in my opinion. The story, the characters, the visual design and music are all second to none and it easily stands amongst the PS2 survival horror greats like Resident Evil, Silent Hill and Haunting Ground, but it's let down by an awful combat system and tedious progression. It's a shame that so many people who play this will probably get too frustrated before they get to experience its story, especially when the combat, easily its most glaring flaw, doesn't even really feel like it needs to be there to begin with. In that sense, Rule of Rose strikes me as a game that came out a few years too early. The heavy emphasis on narration and storytelling makes me feel like it would have fit really well into the walking sim genre in the modern age. Think a game like Dear Esther or Gone Home. I know I am going to get some heat for that in the comments, but the combat just didn't need to exist in Rule of Rose and ended up being its greatest vice. If you're willing to push through regardless, go for it. Hell, even watch a Let's Play or a stream of it. Whatever route you decide to go for, Rule of Rose is one of the most meticulously crafted, deeply moving stories in the video game medium and shouldn't be missed just because of its flawed gameplay. So remember how I mentioned at the beginning of the video that Rule of Rose was subject to a lot of controversy back in 2006, particularly in Europe? Let's talk about it a little bit because, whew, oh my god, it is quite the roller coaster. It all started when a magazine published a very harsh piece about the game, so let's use that as a starting point. On November 13th, 2006, Panorama, an Italian news magazine, released an article with the damning headline, He Who Buries the Girl Alive Wins. The article is very long-winded though, but let's just talk through some of the important parts so I can illustrate to you just how misinformed it really is. A child is buried alive after physical and psychosexual torture of all kinds. Her tormentors, other children. Very, very nasty ones. That's the plot of an upcoming horror title, but it's only the latest in a series based on violence and sadism. So already there's a mistake here. <laughs> Jennifer isn't a child, she is 19. Nothing psychosexual happens whatsoever to her during the story and she is definitely never buried alive at any point. They're clearly referring to the opening cutscene when she falls into the coffin, but that's metaphorical, if anything. That never actually physically happens to her at all. You know, if they played Rule of Rose, they'd know that. Every shot oozes perversion. The shots of the little girl in the coffin, for example, are shot from the side of her feet, with the camera deliberately lingering on Jennifer's still immature form with a little skirt that just can't stay in place. I don't know about you, but this seems like a fairly tame outfit to me. And again, she's not a child, she's 19. The author also has a very strange problem with homosexuality, <laughs> what's new, where they say every scene is pervaded by homosexual and sadistic undertones that you're not prepared for, later saying, in another situation, two young girls hold their hands and tell each other softly, princess, I saved you, now kiss me, editor's note, and <laughs> not on the cheek, and then says one of the girls lifts her skirt in front of the others, it's a, it's a curtsy, they're curtsying, this is the 1930s here, Oh my god, um... <laughs> the author then goes on a ramble that was very typical back in the 2000s, saying games like Grand Theft Auto, Mafia and Bully all apparently glorify violence, murder or just general antisocial behaviour, saying that games like Rule of Rose tantalise the ogre that might reside in those holding the joypads. You hear that guys? We're ogres now apparently. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's clear as day that this article is just trying its best to villainize Rule of Rose and what makes it all the worse is that it was actually plagiarized. <laughs> Chris Darrell, aka the creator of the Remothered franchise, whose games we actually just covered in the last video, published an online review of Rule of Rose on March 28th, 2006, eight months before Panorama's article. So let's look at some of the alleged examples of plagiarism here. In his original Italian review of Rule of Rose, which Chris very kindly linked me for the video, he specifically describes the Hoffman boss fight as the terrifying teacher who finds himself bound by ropes in the airship hangar with a brain now devoid of cells and neurons. This exact same line exists in the Panorama article down to the letter. They only dropped the word airship in their version. 
Similarly, with the description of the final boss fight against Gregory, in Chris's article he is described as the farmer slave who chases and attacks Jennifer at the girl's behest, whereas in the Panorama article it is very slightly altered to the slave big fat and panting who chases and attacks Jennifer at the behest of the aristocrats. Chris ends the review with a very poetic analogy, comparing Jennifer's experiences in the game to climbing a rose, with the thorns thick and sharp. And this entire analogy and paragraph is paraphrased in the Panorama article as well, with only a few alterations to the sentence structure and wording. This plagiarization was quickly noticed by those who had read Chris's review, and many comments were left on the uploaded version of Panorama's article, but these were all apparently deleted. Chris's editors-in-chief contacted the magazine for an explanation regarding the plagiarization, or at least some kind of apology, but there was never any response. Panorama removed the article from their website shortly after that, but even so, big names in the Italian gaming scene, such as Matteo Bitanti, a writer and scholar from Milan who specialises in video games, were all coming forward asking Panorama for an explanation, and also why they kept insisting the game was for children, when Rule of Rose had already been rated as a Peggy 16 title, but it seems no explanation was ever given. The scandal even spread to other countries, with the Czech publication Level Magazine documenting Panorama's actions, even going so far as to say that the only thing that has been buried alive is Panorama's professional integrity. Ouch. <laughs> Chris was only a teenager at the time of the plagiarization, and remembers how the situation made him feel like a victim, saying that now he would absolutely have no qualms about contacting a lawyer, but thankfully he's able to take the positive from the situation as well, having gone on to say, at least there's something I am quite happy about. A professional journalist for an important magazine such as Panorama ended up copying a teenager's review on a forum. It probably meant I did good work. Regardless of the drama, Chris said this review actually helped him kickstart his career in the video game business as a reviewer and analyst, before eventually becoming a developer, now with his own studio, Little Sewing Machine. But unfortunately, thanks to its shocking content and scaremongering, this article did the rounds across the majority of Europe back in 2006. Reactions were overwhelmingly negative towards Rule of Rose, including the Italian president of the Committee for Childhood, Anna Serafini, questioning how such a game could have made it into the market at all, while also admitting in the same breath that she doesn't even know how to turn on a PlayStation. After coverage in major Italian newspapers and TV stations, Rule of Rose was brought up at the Italian Parliament only four days after the publication of the Panorama article. They conclude that a committee should be formed that will evaluate and rate the content of future video games. Wait till they find out that Peggy has already been doing that for years. Within a week or two, the European Commissioner for Justice, Fundamental Rights and Citizenship at the time, Franco Frattini, called for an urgent meeting after watching and apparently being revolted by the quote-unquote obscene cruelty and brutality in Rule of Rose. The game was also quite the hot topic over in the UK in particular, making the headlines in the likes of the Times, the Daily Mail and more, continuing to insist that it was a child's game. The news also made it to Poland, where the Polish Ministry of Education claimed the game's contents were dangerous to children and young people. And it doesn't end there, it kicked off over in France as well, with three deputies introducing a bill to the French Assembly, stating that the goal of Rule of Rose was just to straight up kill children, apparently, and the one who has shown the most infamous, the most repugnant ignominy wins the game. Ignominy means, like, dishonour and disrespect, by the way. Yeah, I didn't know what it meant either. They go on to imply that Rule of Rose could signal the downfall of society as we know it if it were to be released, quite literally begging the French Assembly to hear them out. With all of these countries collectively losing their minds over content that simply does not exist in the game, actual video game organisations run by people who've actually played Rule of Rose were getting sick of the slander. The Video Standards Council in Europe, or VSC, blasted Fratini's claims. I have no idea where the suggestion of in-game sadomasochism has come from, nor children being buried underground. These are things that have been made up. There isn't any underage eroticism. We're not worried about her integrity being called into question because Mr. Fratini's quotes are nonsense. But that didn't stop the European Parliament from whining about the game even more. A few months later, in March 2007, two members of the Parliament called for an intervention to stop games like Rule of Rose being produced because the game is, um, harmful to human dignity, while admitting in the same proposal that their only basis for these claims was the same Panorama article, and they've not played nor watched the game whatsoever. They also wanted to set up what they called a European Observatory on Childhood and Minors to monitor video game content. Oh my god, Peggy is right there! 
The drama got so heated that it even caused bad blood amongst members of parliament themselves. Frattini was still insisting that something had to be done about Rule of Rose and wanted to call all European ministers to discuss the game and its contents. Viviane Redding, the Commissioner for Information Society and Media, clearly got sick of his shit and sent him a letter telling him that he was speaking out of turn about something he knew little about and he should think before he acted next time, reminding him that the Peggy system exists for a reason. Ugh, thank you. Ultimately though, after all was said and done, Rule of Rose only ended up being banned in the UK, and while it came close to being banned in Italy and Poland, it did eventually release in those countries too. As for the US, Sony America passed on publishing it after seeing the chaos that erupted over in Europe, apparently stating it doesn't sync up with their image, which is quite ironic since it was Sony Japan were the ones who wanted the game to be made in the first place. Either way, Atlas swooped in and published Rule of Rose in the States instead. But to say that Rule of Rose's name was tarnished was an understatement. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people just saw the headlines and took them at face value, and Rule of Rose, at least in the eyes of the general public, was forever branded as a disgusting piece of media that is a threat to children and society as we know it. The same Rule of Rose that is a dark but masterfully crafted narrative that delves into topics like childhood trauma and bullying was, somewhat ironically, bullied by people who hadn't even played it. But what made Rule of Rose so particularly controversial, especially since the likes of Silent Hill and Haunting Ground had released years before it, both being titles that delve into equally harrowing topics, what is it about Rule of Rose that caused such widespread moral panic? There's a few possible reasons why. The first and most obvious reason being a lack of respect for the medium of video games. Simple as that. Rule of Rose, at least in terms of what is actually shown on screen, is really quite tame in comparison to other video games. But even if it was overtly violent and grotesque, that's nothing new in media. Films have been doing it for decades, books have been doing it for centuries, but video games have only been doing it for about 50 years. How is it then that newspapers, TV stations, and the entire European Parliament were incapable of fact-checking the Panorama article? Did it never cross any of their minds to perhaps pick up a PlayStation and try Rule of Rose for themselves, or hell, even just get someone else to do it for them? Such blatant disregard would never happen if it was a film or book. But because video games are still a very new medium, that makes it an easy target. Especially for boomers with too much time on their hands who just want to find the newfangled hobby of the younger generation to point the finger at. Not only that, but beyond just being a new medium, there was still a rampant belief back then that video games are exclusively for children. A belief that isn't totally gone still, I would argue. Notice that all of the publications kept insisting that Rule of Rose was a children's game, wrongfully claiming it featured a child protagonist. Despite a Peggy 16 rating, clearly indicating it's for late teens and up, video games, at least in 2006, still had the heavy association of being a child's plaything and not a legitimate art form that can tell compelling, moving stories. The controversy that erupted from Rule of Rose was such a fascinating case that it has even been studied by academic journals. The 2013 publication, Moral Panics of the Contemporary World, featured a study dedicated to Rule of Rose and points out the irony that, despite Rule of Rose being labelled a threat to children, children are the ones who are the most evil in the game itself. It's the children who torment an adult Jennifer. But the media seem to want to gloss over this fact, and there's a very distinct reason why that may be. In horror media, there's the age-old trope of the evil child. Think movies like The Exorcist or The Shining having creepy children, but notice that there always has to be an explanation behind their creepiness. In The Exorcist, she's possessed. In The Shining, they're ghosts. There always has to be something, after all is said and done, to convince the viewer, don't worry, kids can't be evil, as if we have to maintain this idea that children are always innocent, pure beings. Rule of Rose is a very rare exception to this rule. There's no greater reason to why the aristocrats act in an evil and malicious way towards Jennifer. They just do, because some people are just evil, and children are no exception to that rule. The same academic journal points out that Rule of Rose is intentionally designed to be suggestive. What they mean by this is virtually none of the explicit themes it explores are ever shown on screen, so you can interpret it however you wish. Like I mentioned earlier, it makes use of the less is more method of storytelling. Anything concerning or upsetting that you draw from the experience is really being drawn from your own imagination. How ironic then, that all of the people who complained about it, condemning it for, don't forget, tantalizing the ogre that might reside in those holding the joypads, were people who had never even once played it. Believe it or not, this isn't the first time a child-centric story has been under fire from the media. Rule of Rose has often been compared to Lord of the Flies, a 1954 novel written by William Golding. 
For anyone who's not familiar, the story centres around a group of boys whose plane was shot down and they've been left stranded on an island. With no adults to guide them, these boys, who all come from upper class families, descend into savagery, forgetting any sense of civility or order from their lives up until this point. Rule of Rose has often been labelled Lord of the Flies but with girls, and you can really see why. They both tackle the same basic narrative, children without the guidance of parental figures who end up devolving into a brutal dog-eat-dog -dog world. And while Lord of the Flies was mostly praised upon its release back in the 50s and has since become a literary classic, it definitely had its critics as well. It was accused of being cynical, portraying children as selfish creatures, even unrealistic. It seems people are very unwilling to believe that children can do evil things. And it's interesting that despite a 50 year gap between Lord of the Flies and Rule of Rose, it doesn't seem like much has changed. If anything, the backlash was even worse in the modern age. But a lot has changed in the 20 or so years since Rule of Rose's release, and I do think the public opinion of video games has improved a hell of a lot since then. I definitely don't think such an ill-informed controversy would happen nowadays, but even so, it's heartbreaking that Rule of Rose of all games was the one to face such awful slander and bullying in the media back then. With such ruthless backlash, sales were inevitably weak, and the game has never seen any form of re-release since. Even to this day, I can't imagine many companies would want to have their name tied to it given the controversy. And having fallen into obscurity in the years since, Rule of Rose has become literal gold dust. You're looking at hundreds just to own a physical copy of it right now, leaving many people with no choice but to emulate. Whatever way you end up experiencing Rule of Rose though, make sure that you do. Yes, it isn't perfect, but it's an emotional experience that tells a story very few games have managed to achieve. One that reaches into your memories and will remind you of years long gone, of memories both nostalgic and bittersweet. A harrowing tale that explores how innocence can be equal parts terrifying as it is endearing, equally cruel as it is kind. Much like a rose with its beautiful petals and sharp thorns, love can be just as much evil and twisted as it can be tender and sweet. Well, hi! Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it very much. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive into Rule of Rose. If you want more of my kind of content, I do stream horror games over on Twitch. Or alternatively, if you just want to keep up to date with me in general and the video progress, blah, 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 feel free to drop me a follow over on Twitter. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.